Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here in Washington, D.C. at the headquarters of GM Defense, one of the companies who's going to be sponsoring our coverage of the Association of the United States Army's uh, upcoming general meeting in Washington, D.C. And it's our honor to be talking to the president of GM Defense, my good friend Dave uh, Albritton. Dave, uh, it's been about a year uh, since you uh, took on the job. How's it going? Man, it's going great, Vago. Man, thanks for coming over to see us today. Uh, it's been a very interesting year. I mean, GM had been out of the defense business writ large for about 16 years since selling GM Defense to General Dynamics back in 2003. So this is kind of the reimagination of uh, GM Defense in GM, getting full support from the CEO on down across every organization in the company. And it's been great uncovering the resources and just the conceptual uh, opportunities we have for technology that we can bring into the global defense market. Uh, and uh, you were in the... Uh uh, technology side of the business, which is how you got into the defense side of it. I think that people uh, sometimes underestimate the sheer amount of engineering horsepower that a company like General Motors uh, has, and people think that it's purely automotive uh, related. Talk to us about the re-entry into the business. You guys have been talking uh, a lot about some of your proprietary fuel and battery cell technology, but you guys have also incredible capabilities in cyber that a lot of uh, folks don't know. Full disclosure, Northrop Grumman uh, sponsors our, our cyber coverage. Talk to us a little bit about the totality of the new business model that's no longer making M2 machine guns and tanks and all of the things that folks uh, equated General Motors with doing to the new generation and the new re-entry into the business. Well, this goes back to the technology investments that we make writ large in the company. We make upwards of seven to eight billion dollars of investment in R&D every year. And if you think about that in our connected ecosystem of vehicles, um, there's a lot of technologies coming into vehicles that we use every day that we take, you know, full advantage of that we can we think we can reapply and reimagine into the defense market. Cybersecurity is just one example of that. But if you extend that into a connected ecosystem that includes telematics, I can look on my you know cell phone today. I own a GMC Sierra pickup truck, and I know the tire pressure. I know the oil percentage and you think about that from a predictive maintenance capability we think that's something that we could bring forward to the US military and global militaries as well but beyond that just the whole connected ecosystem beyond that um, different types of propulsion systems different type of mobility solutions as it relates to uh, those connected ecosystems we talked about uh, a wide variety of capabilities that we have within General Motors that we are thinking about bringing into these markets so walk us through on each market right because there is a tendency you guys were uh, unveiled to Colorado Auto vehicle. I remember a couple of years ago. Uh, again, we had uh, the you know sort of a more modern iteration of that kind of technology. As you look to you know what we're working with the Army to experiment with do different kinds of propulsion, electric and fuel cell propulsions. You have the Cirrus vehicle, which is potentially game changing if if adopted. That was something you developed on your own uh, on your own nickel. Walk us through from the Army side of things, the Navy side, to the Air Force, and more broadly, because you guys are also looking at this as a global opportunity, not just an American one. Right. So I think you know. As me coming into this job about a year ago, we've kind of taken another look at uh, what markets are going to be most important to us. Obviously, as a vehicle company, integrated vehicles are part and parcel to what we do every day. And so if you look at that from the vehicle opportunities we have in front of us, the infantry squad vehicle with the Army right now is one that uh, we're participating in. Uh, we're you know, great that we got uh, and thankful that we got down selected from uh, five to three, participating in the prototyping phase of that. Uh, we're very confident in our ability uh, to perform in that market because of, you know, the fact that our vehicle um, is 70 percent commercial off the shelf based on an architecture that we are very, very familiar with. Um, beyond that, we're looking at other vehicle programs, the RCV light competition. We have, you know, put forth and responded to the white paper and are very interested in participating in that program. And if you look at other programs, uh, the Army just recently put out a market survey for the JLTV. Um, you know, we provide some capability on that platform already with engines. Uh, there's other things we hope that we could potentially provide for future iterations of that platform as well. So outside of just the vehicles, I mean, if you th think about what we've already done with the Colorado ZH2 as really a proof of concept of of a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle um, being used in different contexts, still have that base knowledge and we can think about reapplying that to future generations of platforms going forward. But what we've heard out of the Army and Marine Corps of late is you know, a, a propensity to move towards silent watch and silent drive. Really the only way you can get there is with electric motors. And so if you think about a hybrid diesel solution is something that's uh, within our wheelhouse. If you think about full electric, which is you know, full battery electric is something that we're doing in commercial markets today. And then ultimately down the value chain to fuel cells is, is something that uh, we believe that we could do very well and hopefully we can introduce into the military services over time. 
And uh, what about uh, Air Force or Navy? Uh, you guys are looking at portable power applications that would, for example, uh, you know, the Navy is interested, for example, in retiring its uh, legendary diesel auxiliary uh, diesel generators that are on submarines with something that might be more uh, re reliable and quieter. Uh, talk to us about some of the other opportunities you guys see here because you're specializing in vast amounts of portable power effectively. Absolutely. Well, it goes beyond. So as, as you said, um, thinking about and reimagining a fuel cell in maybe an un man underwater vehicle. We've been testing that with the U.S. Navy for some years, but you can also contemplate a battery electric. Take a battery out of a Chevy Bolt EV and putting that into a UUV as an application. But stationary power and replacing generators. You know, there's more than 66,000 generators in the U.S. Army. A lot of them go underutilized because they run uh, and only use peak power three, four times a day. So ultimately, some of those generators burn out. That's a big problem downrange. We could replace that with a, you know, hydrogen fuel cell gen set or even a, a stacked battery with a diesel type of gen set, and those are some of the things that we're contemplating. If you think about that across the U.S. Air Force as well, if you think about large flight lines with large aircraft that traditionally use loud diesel applications to power up those airframes, we could replace that with gen sets as well. So we're looking at some of those applications. But if you look more broadly than that, and just in, ter in terms of the technology applications of pilots in, in cockpits and the types of assistance that they get or don't get in the cockpit um, in terms of support and flying that aircraft, you know, what we're doing with active safety um, is very you know, very important for us as a human in a vehicle. Uh, we think there's applications from an AI and machine learning perspective to reapply that in different contexts as well. So there's some things that we're looking at. Um, you know, the Marine Corps obviously being a, a, you know, very near the Army in terms of, you know, ground vehicles. There's other applications that we think that uh, we could help and support with. We're not only just thinking about this from battlefield applications. There are so many bases around the world that could, uh, you know, we could leverage technology and capabilities to, to you know, validate those capabilities, if you will, in the rear with the gear, if you will, on those bases before we even contemplate some of the battlefield capabilities. So this is fun for us to kind of look across our technology sphere and think about how we can help the services as much as possible. Uh, and uh, cyber as well, right? I mean, that's not a name that n folks think about, but you guys, you know, talk to us a little bit about some of the proprietary technologies you guys have developed uh, in the course of developing ever more sophisticated vehicles and vehicle networks around the world. I mean, OnStar uh, is, is an extraordinary thing that was designed and conceived and executed right. by General Motors. Right. Well, if you think about just a car being a node in a network, most cars today have about uh, 10 million lines of code, so it literally operates as a computer with on four wheels. Uh, but to have anything connected to a network, you need cyber protections. There are so many cyber attack points that are available on vehicles today. If you think about tire pressure monitoring systems, you've got telematics, you've got GPS, you've got uh, 4G LTE coming into vehicles, and you could, somebody could just use a dongle to you know, plug into a vehicle as well. We have to protect our connected ecosystem of upwards of 20 million cars that are within that OnStar network. Um, and we think there's ways that we can kind of transition that knowledge, that capability, uh, in the many years, more than a quarter of a century of you know, uh, operating the OnStar program in ways that would help the services think about how they leverage and access technology on their vehicles as well. So some of the things that we're, we're thinking about too. Um, let me uh, take you to um, large change. We're in a period of innovation. All of leadership has been talking about it. The United States Army created Futures Command to accelerate the acquisition process, but also il accelerate innovation. Um, you know, we saw that on display at the DSCI show or at AFA in terms of the senior leadership, and I know it's going to be on full display uh, at AUSA as well. But one of the, how, how is the process working? Because what you guys are proposing as part of your fundamental growth strategy is actually tectonic change mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, the move away from fossil fuels. Mary Barrow, the CEO of General Motors, has talked about a fossil-free future for the company, which is why you guys have been investing, uh, although I have to say you guys have been investing in fuel cells for almost four decades, so I mean there's nothing, nothing new there. You know, talk to us about the sell of this and the progress you're making because you're proposing an ecosystemal change. You're not just saying, hey, let's just get a new vehicle. You're, you know, how, how is that process going of talking to the customer, iterating with the customer, and getting the customer comfortable enough to make some of the changes which everybody knows is going to happen, but, um, you know, the, the question is when? 
I think it's working well. I mean, we've been obviously having to introduce GM and GM Defense to the customer again uh, because we've been out of the market for so long. But I think if you look at the use of different contracting vehicles like OTAs and the customer's willingness to hear ideas from industry, they've been saying that they want more commercial capability to come into the force faster. We are as a, you know, primarily a commercial company. We believe we have capabilities that are interesting. And the fact that the government is interested to hearing ideas from industry is a, you know, dramatic difference from how they've traditionally done, you know, come up with, you know, very specific requirements uh, that are at a level that, you know, requires a lot of development versus leveraging what's already out there in the marketplace today. The fact that they're open to those conversations, you know, in our one-on-one -on -one meetings, and if you look at how they're actually engaging on uh, potential future contracts like the RCB Light, they ask industry to come with your best ideas. That's a, a great opportunity for us because we have a lot of ideas in spaces like that. And so I think the willingness for them to be open uh, to those conversations, to, uh, you know, come with your good ideas. We're seeing that across all the services, and we're welcoming those conversations and really appreciate the opportunity to do so. Do you, do you think that because of, um, you know, uh, focused and more sustainable logistics is a big thing that each of the military services are looking at, given that all of the supply lines that we've now taken for granted are going to be under pressure in a great power competition? And each of the services is also looking for better support from their prime contractors on a variety of different levels. Do you think that that gives you guys on either of those factors a little bit of an edge in having some of these conversations, uh, given that you guys are able to do big things at scale? Um, yes, but no. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, there's things that we want to do with the big customers, but we also want to partner with some of the primes as well and, uh, and other companies. So I think collectively there's things that we can do together. At the end of the day, this is all about supporting a warfighter and, and bringing the best capabilities. If you think about it from a power and propulsion perspective, I mean, the supply chain for JP-8 is long and established. A lot of investment has gone into that. One of the things that we're looking at is how do you reform JP-8 into hydrogen that could be used in a hydrogen fuel cell propulsion vehicle that, uh, you know, you can use at the point in the spear uh, and bring you different capabilities than you have today. Traditionally, when you're going downrange, you'll have to tug a big generator with you. Uh, with a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, you can get exportable power today for us at about 80 kilowatts coming off of that platform. Right then you don't have to have a generator. So it's just a different contextual view on how you leverage platforms, how you leverage technology and capabilities, and that's what we're looking to bring forward. Whether we do that directly with the government, whether we do that with partners, uh, we're open to all those opportunities and we're looking across uh, the marketplace for that. Um, but do you think that because you guys are a giant commercial company that is able to deliver vast amount of product and then support it over time and try to do that with lean supply lines are things that could synchronize and mesh well with what the customer is interested in, which is lightened logistics load uh, and, and better sort of end-to-end -end service and higher reliability factors, right? I mean, people buy GM cars because when they get out to a GM car and they turn the key, it starts. Uh, you know, do you think that that gives you kind of a, an opportunity there with the customer? I think it uh, gives us an edge in certain programs. Uh, if you look at the infantry squad vehicle, you know, our entry into that competition is based on our Chevy Colorado ZR2 Bison. So that's an architecture that we already have. We use that platform in off-road racing, a uh, very good success rate with that. We've got more than 10,000 miles of testing, you know, with off-road racing with that platform. And the platform that we put forth in the ISV competition is based on 70% commercial off-the-shelf parts. So if you think about that from a sustainment perspective, if you think about just an access to parts and, you know, repairs and those types of things, wherever you are around the world, um, you know, that's an architecture that we have uh, and we use in a lot of places beyond the United States. And so we think that gives us an advantage. It's a distinguishable advantage uh, to do that. And so if we're able to do that across more platforms, um, I think, you know, we could enable um, the military to spend less on sustainment um, and, you know, for maintenance and those types of things because they have a proven uh, company that has a track record of providing these parts in a very cost-efficient way. Um, uh, General Motors is uh, undergoing, like a lot of the automotive industry, you know, before we started taping, we were talking about the Frankfurt uh, Auto Show and how personal automotive uh, ownership is, uh, is declining as a trend. Uh, there are a lot of concerns about what the future of the automotive industry, that's one of the reasons why Mary Barra is looking at uh, a completely different transportation network uh, future for General Motors, especially one for in, in clean energy. Um, how important is the General Motors defense diversification from a General Motors corporate standpoint at a time when it may be producing less vehicles on a, on a yearly basis than it's been for 
uh, than it's been in the past. I think the best way to describe it is that GM Defense provides GM with optionality. We're looking at a number of innovative businesses and business models to bring capability to the forefront, you know, outside of traditional vehicle markets. Because if you look at the, the purchasing trends in the inner cities, not as many people are buying vehicles. Uh, the younger folks, just I mean, even my son, I mean, he's 17, and I've been trying to push him for two years to get his driver's license, and we're just getting there. He just got his license here as a 17-year-old. So less interest in, in the urban markets to buy vehicles, but still a huge need uh, to get from point A to point B. And how we're looking at that from the usage models of, you know, car sharing, ride sharing, those types of things, you know, those are models that uh, we believe are the future and we're investing heavily in and, and we're showing some success. Uh, we could, we believe we could bring some of those uh, ideas into the military. If you think about a, a captured fleet of vehicles that are bought through GSA that sit 90% of the time on a, on a base, well, we could think about different models to actually at least those vehicles, utilize those models, I mean, those vehicles in different ways. So that's just one thing. But I think the overall investment that we're making in autonomous vehicles, et cetera, those are things as the world changes that we think uh, that we could leverage uh, for future capabilities. Uh, if you think about platooning and leader follower and those types of things. Um, you know, we've heard from the customer they don't necessarily want an autonomous robocop out there making decisions about how and where to fire weapons. But there's capabilities in the autonomous world today uh, with our capabilities such as our super cruise capability, which is a hands-free driving system in our Cadillac, CT6 today, but it will be future in all future Cadillacs. Um, there's, you know, adaptations of that capability that would be, I think, very well aligned with where the military needs to go um, in next generation capability. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, and it's extraordinary. And if you think you can slack off and let the car do the driving, the car every three seconds is scanning your eyes to make sure that you're looking at the road, which I think is a very, very clever. It's all uh, about safety. It, it's all about safety. And your, your seat vibrates and your steering wheel goes red. So those are pretty good warnings to put your hands on, uh, back on the wheel. Uh, very uh, quickly, because I know you've got to go to your next appointment. Uh, mergers and acquisitions, right? Uh, you have a, uh, you know, original Originally, uh, United States Navy, uh, but you were at Raytheon, a uh, very key player at ITT uh, as well, two companies that had a great track record of acquisition, especially uh, while uh, you were uh, there. And even at Excellus, correct? ITT, and I should have said Excellus, uh, and then Excellus obviously going into the Harris organization that in turn went into L3, uh, another full disclosure, L3 Harris is one of our sponsors as well uh, at uh, AUSI, AUSA as well. You know, talk to us a little bit about what, are, are you looking at? potential acquisition targets at this point in order to try to grow the business and to fill that out, not just from your perspective, but also fit into the broader GM ecosystem? We're going to be looking across. I mean, from partnerships to potential M&A to everything that is going to make it right for us to operate in this environment that's very dynamic uh, and we want to be successful over time. There are things as a core automotive company that we just don't bring to the marketplace that we feel when combined you know, with our capabilities could give us an advantage. Um, and so we're going to look at those things strategically the right way uh, over time, try to make the right investments, um, and we'll just kind of see how it goes. Uh, and uh, last question. There's a General Motors strike uh, that's ongoing. I'm not going to ask you to comment on that, obviously, because it's something that is uh, under uh, constant negotiation between General Motors and the uh, International Aus uh, Automotive uh, Workers uh, Union. But is there a danger that the financial impact will trickle down? I mean, that was always one of the challenges when Hughes was with General Motors or any other defense arm that was part of a large commercial company was if there were any impacts, trade-related impacts or anything else. I know that that's been a little bit of a challenge uh, that's taken up a little bit of the bandwidth of General Motors uh, management, the trade war between uh, Japan, uh, China and the United States, especially given how popular General Motors vehicles are, are in China. Um, do you see that having any kind of impact on you and the resources you have and the investment you're going to have to grow uh, at an important time uh, for your business? In the current construct, not, not really. I mean, you know, perhaps there might be, you know, a little bit of impact, but, you know, really the company is just focusing on trying to, you know, really get work with the union and try to get to pass the impasse and, and really get back to work. Uh, for us long term, as we think about, you know, the operating model and how we connect within General Motors, that will be obviously one of uh, the considerations in terms of how, what workforce we actually leverage uh, to build vehicles, to sustain vehicles, those types of things. Uh, but we've not completed all that work and are continuing to work on that stuff. 
And uh, last one, what are you going to be highlighting? What are we going to see on the stand at uh, AUSA when we get there? Because every year you guys have had something interesting on there. So what are we going to see this year? Uh, this year, you know, we're really excited about our ISV. You're going to see that in the center of the floor. I mean, we've, we've gotten a lot of positive response from a lot of folks who have seen it. Um, so we're pretty uh, excited about that. But it's really just more education about our capabilities. If you look across what we think we bring to the market and, and uh, what would be new and unique, obviously the, you know, the hydrogen fuel cell and power propulsion, you know, uh, lithium ion battery. Uh, is cornerstone to what that is, but that whole connected ecosystem and the full explanation of how that work and how that could work in a defense context is something that we want to really educate folks about and hopefully, you know, then create up a lot of, you know, opportunities for the future. So we're pretty excited about that. Dave Alberton, President of General Motors Defense. Uh, Dave, always a pleasure and looking forward to seeing you at AUSA. Thanks. Appreciate it, Bob. Take care.